Hello, I'm Frances Deegan Horowitz, President of the City University Graduate Center. Welcome to Women to Women, a series of programs for and about us. I'm delighted that Dr. Marcia Keyes is able to join us. She was recently appointed as president of CUNY's York College, but she's hardly new to the system, having been not only with York before, but most recently as vice president for academic affairs at Bronx Community College. We'll discuss her new position and the challenges that face her and as each of us as educators. Good to have you here. Thank Marcia, you for inviting me. You were born in Jamaica, yes, in I Kingston. Was. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up there? Yes, I did. I spent my formative years in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, in a little suburb, you might call it, um, uh, called Halfway Tree, <laughs> and that's because of a big tree that was cut in half. And um, I left Jamaica, actually, at just about age 20. I had graduated from high school at age 18, and I had worked for about a year and a half in a bank. Um, and then I decided to leave Jamaica to go to Canada to continue my education. It was always my intention to continue, but it was always uh, also the habit then to work for a year or two. Why Canada? Well, and, and Winnipeg, Manitoba, <laughs> not exactly the same climate as Jamaica. No, in those days, even though I had studied geography very well, <laughs> and I knew the climate would be different, truly I didn't know that we would be so much in the deep freeze. But some of um, why Canada really has to do with a kind of tradition uh, in Jamaica. First of all, at that time, we had very limited opportunities for higher education because we had, had and still have one university with very limited capacity and very, very competitive. We also had a tradition in Jamaica of going to the Commonwealth, to England uh -huh. or to Canada. And of course, Canada was a part of the Commonwealth. Many of our uh, younger people too also came to, to the United States. My sister, in fact, went to Howard. But I decided that I wanted to do the Canadian thing. It was part of the Commonwealth. I felt comfortable there. And quite frankly, Francis, the school fees were just the best you could ever get. Uh, I paid uh, probably $400 per year back in 1962 per year for tuition and another maybe $400 for room and board. So it was a very affordable way for my parents to get me to college. What did you study there? My major was English and I minored in Latin, but please don't ask me to repeat any <laughs> Latin phrases. Um, I had always had a passion for English, uh, for the language and for the literature. And I'd been a pretty devoted student, I must say, pr most of my life, and had very interesting and um, uh, kind of influential English teachers. And I thought they were great role models, and so I went down that path. And what did you do when you finished? Well, when I finished, I, uh, the, the program at that time at the University of Manitoba was a three-year program because in, um, in the Commonwealth and in Jamaica, we have a sixth form. And if you completed sixth form, then you just needed three years to the baccalaureate. So I did it and you know, equipped myself fairly effectively and then spent about a year, less than a year, in Toronto kind of finding myself. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I wanted to do whether to return to Jamaica, which was the original plan, or whether to come to the United States. And after working for a little while in an insurance company on projects, I decided that I wanted to continue my education, and at that time I decided to come to the United States. So I had very strong motivation because my sister lived here, as did my mother at that time, and so I thought I would join my, at least a part of my family in the United States, so I came to New York. And what did you do? Well, in New York, I, for the first year or two, I merely worked, um, meaning having had the baccalaureate, I, need, what, I wanted to go on to the master's program, wasn't sure where. And so I found work as a daycare teacher <laughs> um, uh, in the Bronx and in Manhattan while I tried to figure out where I would go to school. And in time, by about 1969 or so, I was admitted to Teachers College Columbia. And I spent uh, two years there completing a master's degree. And then? And then, 
Of course, you, rem you remember the late 60s and early 70s. It was the boom for education. It was the civil rights movement. Many things were opening up. It was my intention, of course, to be a high school teacher. That mm. was basically um, what I'd been mentored to do, not only by my teachers, but by members of my family. And I came now to the conclusion of the master's degree. I had by then taken some teacher education courses, but I'd also now, for the first time, been really exposed to African American literature. And I took, I can't call it a minor, but I took some courses. And it was a time when the City University was expanding. Um, and I was recommended for a job at Queensboro. They were looking for someone who had a specialty in African American literature and who could also teach English. And so I was very fortunate to be recommended by my advisor, Dr. Robert Bone, to go to Queensboro for interviews and they selected me to teach the basic uh, rhetoric and writing, but also to teach some aspects of African American literature. It was really a major breakthrough for me because I had not up to that time really considered college teaching. I just thought, well, I just thought, I thought I would make my way, if you will, and make my contribution at the high school level. And you never left CUNY. I never left CUNY, except for moments, <laughs> I must say. But CUNY has been my career since 1971, with some intermittent um, stopouts, a little bit like our students <laughs> sometimes, uh, unexpected stopouts for reasons that had to do more with the condition of CUNY at the time than with my own choice. You will remember the 1970s, uh, the expansion in the early 70s, and then the uh, bankruptcy of New York in the mid-70s. Uh, I happened to have been retrenched, actually. <laughs> Fired is really what I was uh, for lack of budget. But I still wanted to keep my uh, connection with CUNY and with Queensboro. And even then, I still wanted to teach. And by then, I had started to pursue the doctorate, the EDD. And I was really a little bit tentative, quite frankly, because I was taking courses, I was teaching, but it wasn't kind of leading me in that seamless path, mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were. And I did do a little stopping out of the doctoral program, too, uh, for financial reasons. But at some point, with help from friends and family, it became real clear if I wanted to be in higher education, I needed to complete it. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while. But I did complete it in 1984. And the doors really opened thereafter mm -hmm. for me. And the teaching led you into also administration. It did, in a very uh, indirect way, of course. Um, I taught for probably six or seven or eight years, even after I had been retrenched, but I would come back as a substitute, you know, <laughs> substitute appointment when maybe a f another faculty member was away for a leave. And I just kept sort of hanging in there. But then an opportunity opened up at Queensboro um, and I thought, you know, maybe I'll try my hand at administration. I really didn't have much experience at it, except for very kind of localized jobs in my community. I lived in the Bronx, the Wakefield section of the Bronx. And while I lived in the Bronx, I did a lot of um, sort of community service work, you know, in the neighborhood, tutoring, or working in summer programs as a sort of assistant administrator, just to sort of help out. And um, I saw a job, actually, as a continuing education director. And I thought, I think I can do that. And I thought, and that's real money, you know, tax levy money, <laughs> it's a, a job. I applied for it. I didn't get that job. But I did get what I consider a consolation prize, which really opened the door to administration for me. And at that time, I got a very small job uh, working as an assistant director for the homebound program. I don't know if you know that program, Francis. Yeah, it's been around for almost 30 years, serving disabled students who are unable to come to class but can take classes by telephone. So I managed uh, that program as an assistant director for about three to four years. And that was my entree into administration. And so you stayed at Queensboro. Yes, I and, did. But then you moved on. That's right, I did. I, um, Queensboro really took me up to about 1984. 
1983, late 1983. And what happened then is having done the administrative work, that little bridge opportunity with the homebound program, I realized I liked it. I liked administration, um, even though I had been, in my mind anyway, a, a, a quite good teacher. And, you know, the, the power of the classroom and the power of the being there, the energy, the excitement. But I liked administration, and I saw a job advertised in the New York Times that fit me to a T. If I had written the job description, it couldn't have been better. Uh, and so I applied for it. It was an assistant to the direct, uh, it was assistant to the dean for labor relations and personnel at LaGuardia Community College. And I applied for it, I interviewed for it, I struggled my way into the pool, and then I ended up with a job offer. And really, I haven't looked back. <laughs> that was really, that was my real breakthrough, if you will. And LaGuardia was a very, very good place for me. Um, it was an exciting institution. It was led at that time by Joe Shanker. He is known to be really a very talented administrator, very creative, and very supportive. Uh, you may know Gussie Kapner, mm -hmm. who is uh, one of his protégés. I consider myself one of his protégés, too, and I really took off. I mean, a lot of hard work, I'm, I must tell you, late nights, early mornings, you know, some aggravation, but a lot of good support at that institution. And ultimately, um, you found yourself at your college. Yes. As, well, no, before that, but you've been acting president. I have. At... At BMCC, at Borough of Manhattan, Borough Manhattan Community. Community College. And York College. And at York, right, for just about eight months at York, but and a full year at BMCC. And then ultimately at Bronx Community College. That's as right, vice as the Academic Affairs, Affairs Vice President. And that's now right. you find yourself back at, at York. York. That's correct, yes. And what have you found? Well, what I have found at York is really a very solid academic institution. Good faculty with great, um, great training, PhDs. Uh, faculty engaged in research, especially in the sciences and the social sciences. Um, uh, curricula with good accreditation, and uh, some growing areas also, like aviation management. And the way I've sort of assessed the condition is by, as you know, looking at the Middle States Review, and looking at the periodic review. And when I studied that document, and since I've written some of them, I sort of know how to read them, I, f I was quite warmed by the fact that the Middle States reviewers who came to see us the last time around and the periodic uh, reviewers gave York a fairly solid bill of health on the academic side of the house. We need to do some outcomes assessment, and that we need to do. We also need to do some planning, and I've actually kicked that particular process off. Where we seemed to be weaker uh, is in the area of the support to students. Um, student support, uh, academic advisement, tutoring, supplemental instruction, and also in the way we sort of don't really seamlessly Admin, uh, provide the administrative services that students need to go in a fairly straight path um, towards their, their focus on, on, on the academics. But Marcia, mm -hmm. in many ways, mm -hmm. York has been a somewhat troubled institution. Mm -hmm. By my count, mm -hmm. in the last 14 years, it's had six presidents. This is true. Why? Um, I cannot assess why that is so. I believe that certainly um, the institution is troubled uh, you know, with that history, but I don't believe the institution, the internal run, you know, the internal uh, elements of the institution really um, suggest that there is a reason. Now, some people might argue that um, the right fit of presidential leadership was not there. 
you know, and that is, I think, an important issue because you can't uh, ignore the fact that there were six presidents, albeit only three permanent presidents. But even then, that's that's quite it's, a number. It's quite a revolving door. In it is. Ways. It has been a revolving door, and um, it. I, I hope that the revolving door will have come to an end. I hope that York has found its right fit, uh, partly because not only because I was there before, but because I know the the CUNY system and because of my work really as the academic VP I must say that had I been offered this job in 1996 on a permanent way in a permanent way when I was there I might not have felt as confident as I do now mm -hmm. to do the job but having worked at Bronx uh, Community College with very similar problems if you will seven years ago a declining enrollment a sort of perception problem, why go to Bronx community? It's Bronx, <laughs> it's a community college, you know, two strikes, if you will. And then also uh, the fact that, you know, are the academic programs really there? And uh, the resources. So having been in that situation once, and having seen how we worked our way out of that with really good leadership, and I tell you, uh, it's not just having been the vice president, but it's having been the vice president under the leadership of Carolyn Williams. Uh, I see her as a real template, if you will, of the way you can build a team, the way you can focus on the goals, and really bring your institution to be the best Bronx in that case and the breast York it can be and I won't want to compare myself with Lehman or Medgar I will want to compare York with the past York can we be a better York College and I just think that with that experience I can help to lead us to that uh, goal. York is a, what we, in the CUNY system we yeah. call a senior college yes and that it is, is for you mm -hmm. and it does not have the associate degree, which is a two-year, which that is correct. both John Jay College and College of Staten Island That's have, right, and Medgar Evers. And Medgar Ever has. Mm -hmm. Should it have the associate degree? I, I don't think it, I don't think so. No, that's not a part of uh, York's mission. York was established as a senior college. It can survive very well as a senior college. It needs to be more competitive, certainly. And it does need to bridge um, to bridge into the high schools. I think it also needs to expand um, its scope for students. It also needs to say to the to CUNY and to its um, and to its uh, constituents, we have a solid science program. There's nothing wrong with it. Students leave there and do pre-med. We have a very good relationship with Downstate. We have a solid pre-dental program. One of our stellar students just is getting a $100,000 scholarship to go to NYU Dental School. We have an excellent, well-accredited social work program at the baccalaureate level. So I believe that we can, we can hold our ground as a senior college with very good articulation agreements with our very good sister colleges, Queensboro on the one hand, where I served some time ago, and LaGuardia on the other hand. So I believe that um, we, you know, the mission was to serve this particular community as a senior institution, and I wouldn't see a shift in that mission at all. You know, it seems to me that York has an, <clears throat> an enormous set of opportunities, particularly under your leadership, in that for some time there's been this attempt to create this niche yes. in the sciences, mm -hmm. in the health sciences, right. and with the FDA, Correct. the Federal Drug Administration right. facility on mm -hmm. your campus, mm -hmm. and as a an institution that is serving predominantly minority students yes. mm -hmm. and the need right. to attract more minorities into the sciences, into the health mm -hmm. professions. Mm -hmm. How do you see your growing in that way? Well, mm -hmm. I see this as uh, an area that should remain a magnet. Now, I think it is already in very many ways because our natural and applied science department is a very strong one with good research and as I say we get great results however I think we need capacity there so what we do really need to do is to find 
the linkages to the high schools, which we're doing through college now, through something called the SEMA program, where we work in the science area with the middle and high schools, to assure that the students in Queens, especially in Southeast Queens and beyond, because I, I'm not at all limited to Southeast Queens, although I'm dedicated to Southeast Queens as a first priority, to assure that those students have the kind of skills and uh, academic support they need to be able to compete in the science program. I think that's a real mission of, of York. Uh, you mentioned also the allied health area, and it's, it's related. Um, and we've just, for instance, uh, developed a physician assistant program. Mm. Yet we have, on the other hand, a 30-year-old occupational therapy program which now, by the way, gives the master's degree. So, you know, it is really, uh, their magnet, I don't want to call it flagship, but their magnet programs at York, which really serve a broader population, but can bring minority students, and by the way, the minority students are changing there. They're not all African American. Hmm. They're immigrants from Southeast Asia. They're immigrants from the Caribbean. And, um, we believe that there are some untapped <laughs> uh, immigrants, uh, Greeks, for instance. There's a large Greek uh, um, neighborhood in Queens where, again, immigrant neighborhoods where students could benefit from a York experience because, of course, the immigrant experience is one that says affordable but good education. And so I see York continuing to serve the African-American community in the immediate Southeast Queens and St. Albans and so on, but I also see us going broader and serving the new f inflows of immigrants who happen not necessarily to be African-American or even black, they may be Southeast Asians or others. But all of this is gonna take resources. Yes. And as we all know, <clears throat> the public commitment of resources to higher education, not only in New York, but all over the country, is declining. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of a challenge is that going to be? Well, it, it is a big challenge, and I'm really quite uh, aware of the need for dollars, and I mean serious dollars. But the argument I've been making and made as early as uh, my first conversation with the chancellor on this uh, because of the fact that I've been in CUNY and I know what the issues are, I said we're going to need some sustained investment from the central office, from you know the chancellor and the trustees, above and beyond the norm at York, because we have been um, at York under-resourced for probably 12 or so years, and so we haven't achieved the sort of regular growth that other institutions might have achieved. Uh, I think the chancellor understands that. Now, I'm not sure where the money is going to come from, but I think that we at York are prepared, A, to, be, to do some self-help. And the self-help piece is the piece that, f that focuses on en uh, enrollment growth and retention. The other self-help piece focuses on uh, building a foundation but of course, you really can't build a foundation until you have confidence. What you mean by foundation is a private a private foundation, foundation to help you fundraise. That's right. That's right. But you you need to do that when you have the confidence of the community, meaning the corporate community. So I think we're going to take a little time first to improve our academic infrastructure, and then go to the corporate foundation building. So that's the self-help that I'm prepared to do. But I'm also expecting, and I'm not sure where it will come from because I know we don't have a good budget year, I'm also expecting that the university will step up to the plate as it has promised because it does believe that in some ways in the past the university did not understand York's problem and could not help. Well, now I'm assuring that they understand York's problem and that they will help. And I have gotten assurances that they will do so. Um, we don't have much time left. Mm -hmm. I just want to shift because I noticed this in your, 
your resume and it is yeah. fascinating. Mm -hmm. You were the founding editor of Carib News. Yes, How did I that was. happen? Well, it happened as things often happen through friendships. Uh, the founders of Carib News, Carl and Faye Rodney, are lifelong friends of me, my sister, and my family. We didn't quite grow up in the same neighborhood in Jamaica, but uh, Carl's younger sister is a classmate in high school of my older sister. And so we knew each other in those relationships. When we all lived in New York, uh, Carl and Faye had the best New Year's Eve parties, <laughs> you know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and they still host that, sometimes in their home in Mamaroneck and sometimes in their home in Jamaica. So when they had this dream of putting together a weekly paper, they actually came to visit me in my home in the Bronx and my sister, and we sat over dinner and they pitched this idea. And I said, you guys are crazy, <laughs> is what I said, because they were both raising children, they were, um, they were working in corporate jobs, and I said, this is such a big venture. What, what year was this? This was 1983. And Carib News continues to today? It continues today. I'm, I'm no longer the founding editor because at some point in time as I climbed the career, I realized I couldn't very well editorially criticize <laughs> our politicians, <laughs> our governor, for instance, our mayor, as I might have done when I was uh, a mayor, quote unquote, faculty member. So I did have to sever those relationships. But of course, they remain friends of mine, and I watch the growth of the newspaper. It's done remarkable service for the, uh, for the Caribbean community here in New York. Well, Marcia, I'm sorry we're out of time. My thanks to Dr. Marcia Keyes uh, for being on uh, Women to Women. For Women to Women, I'm Frances Deegan Horowitz, president of the City University Graduate Center. Thank you. Thank you.